But real quick, if you haven't heard about the FX Summit 2023 conference in Miami, make sure you guys grab your tickets, fxsummit2023.com. We'll make sure to see you there June 9th to the 11th. Come learn from some of the best traders, investors, and crypto enthusiasts. We'll see you guys there. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another incredible episode of the Expert Trader podcast series. I have somebody, and I'm very excited about this podcast because I was just telling him I used to watch a lot of his videos. Mr. Ken Chigbo, aka Ken FX Freak, is stopping by the show. Welcome, Ken. Thank you very much, Roy. That's an absolute pleasure. I'm glad to uh, be finally getting on here with you, man. <laughs> I'm glad to have you on here. I'm glad to talk about the importance of fundamentals, which is a conversation I feel like we need to have more of. So I'm excited for you to kind of walk us through that. But for the folks that don't know who you are, you want to give us a quick rundown? Yeah, a quick rundown in a nutshell. Um, I started my career in terms of my step into the markets was as a initiate. I was a T boy on a uh, on a trade floor. There's a floor of prop traders in London, so I'd be getting their breakfasts, lunch, their dinners. Um, I was hungry. I was seeing all these prices and everyone showing this energy on uh, on the screens. I was like, man, I want a piece of this pie. So I was just showing how tenacious I was, speaking to everyone, networking on the floor as much as I could as a you know as a teenager. I was a as eighteen, and then. Um, a group of analysts that are on the trade floor that used to feed information to these traders, you know, fundamentals was a massive thing. Um, it still is obviously, but these guys were reacting to every bit of news. So these analysts would cover all of that news flow. So they spoke to me. They're like, look, we can give you a trial for, for two weeks. Uh, do you want to take it up? And I was like, man, I'm taking this with both hands. Definitely. So they brought me in. They started me on like monetary policy, central bank speakers, all of that gave me a test in my first week. And man, I was an idiot because I tried to cheat on that chest I had had like all the bank of england members written down on a paper and they caught me then they're going to get rid of me i was like shit that's this is a wake-up call um so basically I, I i did the hard work and then uh proved them wrong so um carried on i, I was an analyst for four years covering like all markets so forex forex commodities fixed income you name it everything uh, my job was to sit in front of literally 20 plus screens you probably check out on youtube like years 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 go years back type in my name and you'll see I did a video in front of all these screens and basically my my role to just digest everything that was moving the markets fundamentally and then relay that over to the traders let them know what's going on covering all key data points so on and so forth so that's how I built up my knowledge of fundamentals that's how I got my main exposure to to markets I then went into like forex broken for a while worked for a couple of big institutions um just dealing with corporations that were doing uh, foreign exchange, real foreign exchange flow. So they're exchanging millions of pounds to dollars, dollars to euros, all of that stuff, helping to manage that risk. Got tired of that. The corporate world started to really weigh down on me. And I was like, man, I've built all this knowledge. I've got all this capital. Let me work on an, uh, you know, an escape plan, a plan to, to for me to be where I want to be. And that was to trade my own book uh, and be in control of, of my life in, in some es essence. So that's what I did. I, 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 I sort of went and started planning away for 12 months. It took me, um, you know, a good solid uh, amount of time to, to build capital, enough capital, but then also to perfect my strategy, uh, perfect my way um, within the markets. And that was back in 20, uh, 2016 um, that I took that bold, that leap of faith, if you want to call it. And I haven't looked back since. <laughs> There you go. All right. So there was a lot there that I, that I want to touch on, but I kind of want to go in chronological order. So yeah. from being on the trading floors before you were an analyst, what did you learn from uh, the day to day live trading of news? The day to uh, everything back then was you, you you had to you had to react like quickly um, to, to to data. So this is this was even I'm talking. Well, let's go back to the back end of 2008 when I really well 2000 back in 2008 start 2009 when I started as an analyst. The time then was different to now in terms of the fundamental news. You had an opportunity. It was about how quick your fingers are, man. You, you, we weren't competing so much as we are now with all these algos and these machines in the market. We were just competing with other fast traders. How quickly can you press buy or sell? So uh, fundamentals were massive in terms of, so as soon as you get that data release that's coming out, it hits the Bloomberg terminals, you react. Um, and what was beautiful was, yes, you react initially on whether that data was good or bad, but then there was an opportunity. So, so for example, I'll give you a, a case. GDP, um, say GDP came out, growth domestic product, which was big back then. It's it's lost its significance, but the data would come out, be strong. We'd spike higher by like 70 pips and then we'd pull back by around 30 uh, just for a couple of minutes and then it would go again. And that was how easy it was back then if you were just 
well, just paying attention to the data point and, and reacting to that. So um, fundamentals are massive, but it, it, it's changed a lot. It was a lot easier than to be, to, to be honest with you, bro. Yeah. So, I mean, what about today? Do you feel like there's a chance for retail traders to compete with institutions based on all the technology they have to, to do like the live trading day-to-day uh, -day news? Or do you feel like it's probably smarter to kind of take a, a longer time frame approach? Yeah, if, if, if I'm honest, I, I don't think there's a lot of opportunity to try and react straight away on the back of um, news releases, in my opinion, where there is an opportunity to, to make money, as you said there, and looking at the, the longer time frame, looking at the bigger picture of things is then, OK, so once this data has come out or once this central bank has spoken, um, you know, about the future of rate rises or the future of the economy, it's then formulating a view um, and then um, Typically, like, for example, when we have the FOMC, if you go all the way back on the chart, if you look at a Dixie, the dollar index, back in June 2021, these guys started communicating to the markets that, look, guys, we're going to there's, there's going to be lift off soon in terms of rates. This was, bear in mind, just after, you know, the pandemic, things have calmed down now. So now we want to start moving away from all of this pumping, pumping money into the markets, low interest rate environment. We want to raise rates. Look at June 2021, a Dixie dollar index. We started picking up and then. So they communicated that now, and that's not us straight away trading what they said at the rate decision. Right. It's us digesting and this being a-, a, a um, It's like a three to four month tone. play, for sure. So it's not, I said it's like a three to four month play. From the moment exactly. they announce it, you'll have the rally and then you'll have a reaction later. Sure. Exactly. So like they set, basically a trend is set. You know, as you have a technical trend, now we've got a fundamental trend, we've got a theme. So now we're trending to the upside and every pullback that we get, you know, and then we're looking as a technical, you know, as a technical analyst, where, how can I get in on this pullback? Because these dips are going to be bought. So uh, in that sense, there's a lot of opportunity for retail traders to make money if they're in line with those themes. Yeah. Perfect. That's incredible. From being, so from seeing the trading floor to then being an analyst, what sort of information are traders looking for? Because I'm, I'm assuming as an analyst, you're a filter for information. There's a million different things going on. You filter the most important. What are those most important things that you would hand over to the traders? Uh, the most important thing, well, this has come down to, to data compiling, like, and this is something that I still do to, today. So one of the things that I used to do that I still do to this very day is um, every, for, ex for example, um, when I'm analyzing or before, before I'm looking to trade, um, you know, because for me, I'm, I'm more of a lo longer term view of things. But when I'm looking to trade, I'm comparing each currency. So if we look at euro versus the dollar, I'm putting together a spreadsheet and I'm putting, uh, I'll, I'll, seg I'll, I'll field everything up. So we've got the Eurozone's growth. We've got the Eurozone's employment picture. We've got the Eurozone's inflation. And then obviously, you know what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to be comparing that to the dollar. So all I'm doing, I'm obtaining all the information. You can go, just type it into Google. You'll get the, the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, posting all, all the data on their website and just input it into a spreadsheet. And this is your first step into becoming a fundamental analyst or a fundamental trader. You're you're comparing the economies, you know, the data points. So you don't need to be looking at all everything. These institutions are overcomplicating things. No, just make it simple. Just compile that data yourself and then form a view, you know, to, to some extent. Beautiful. What do you think are the differences between an analyst and a trader? An analyst can't trade. <laughs> so because I tell you why. Um, initially, that's why I couldn't trade. I struggled in my years as as analysts trying to trade because with an analyst these guys are analysts for a reason they they give they have a view they'll have a view for both sides they, they'll they'll just combust if they try and trade because they'll be like oh okay let me click buy euro dollar oh no no wait this is happening so it an, an analyst cannot trade a trader can be um you know root, uh, ruthless in their decision have enough conf confluences to take a trade and they'll just press execute whereas an analyst will just be um and ah and uh you know hesitating basically so like paralysis by analysis basically yeah well said that's it exactly exactly Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> so from the uh so then moving over to the forex broker side what were some of the big lessons and takeaways that you had from that experience as a for forex broker uh, so, good. Yeah, so i worked in deliverable foreign exchange bro so, so were, you um, on the, were you on the executive side were you on the relationship management side or were you actually looking at the trader data stuff no, so I was on the um, I was on the relationship manager side. So I had a book of um, about three hundred SMEs, so small to medium uh, businesses uh, that were doing hundreds of thousands, sometimes up to a million uh, in, in foreign exchange flows. So um, my role each day was to uh, be in tune with what's going on in the markets because I'm trying to help them with the timing of that transaction. 
Um, what I do know, though, from an int uh, if you're on an institutional level, a lot of these guys that are in the banks, for example, JP Morgan's, your Deutsche Banks, most of these guys that are analyzing things or or executing are just monkeys. You know, they're given the information. Uh, they're, they're, they're just regular people, to be honest, bro. So, you know, when people always say, oh, you know, Deutsche Bank said this or Goldman Sachs said this, they're just the regular person that gets shit wrong uh, uh, most of the time that are just speaking up their book for their own sake. Um, so I, I never really put these guys on a pedestal, right. um, to be honest with you. So if you're asking me um, what what I take away is, is just exposure, just being in that environment, uh, I guess, if you can... Get in that environment is is great. It's great for your own just sort of the working knowledge of the industry. So yeah. did you get a, did you get a pretty good working knowledge on like the back end mechanics of how orders are being sent to market or how pricing is done on the exchange side or any of that kind of knowledge or is it just mostly uh, relationship building? Yeah, mostly relationship building. I didn't get get to get a good feel of the back end, bro. Uh, to be honest with you, no, no. I, think, yeah. I mean, I they mean, keep it, it pretty be... tight. That's why I'm I'm trying to pry it out of you because I, I figured it was a pretty. Uh, it was a pretty closed off sort of environment on the on that side. But yeah. let's move over to the retail trading. So obviously mm. it doesn't happen overnight. You tried to make the transition, your escape plan. And so mm. talk to me about the process of becoming a trader and some of the trials that you had to go through. Yeah. I mean, when, when I first started trading, it was trying to just simply trade fundamentals. And don't get me wrong. It worked fairly well. Like I, I gave you the example of how easy it was to trade on, on the back of data points, but I had no plan. I had no, I had no technical approach to the market. Like if you go and look at my chart, initially it was completely bare. I'll just look at candlesticks and just try and trade the news. Um, then I realized that didn't work. So I, then I started um, reading into technical analysis, you know, as your usual approach, um, looking at trend lines, MAs, RSIs, all of that. I put it all in my chart, basically. I put it all in my chart and my chart became very noisy. It's scary. I'm sure you're aware, uh, you know, it's, we've all been there. Um, so I tried trading just fundamentals. I tried trading every technical in the book and it still didn't work. And then I started to realize um, psychology came into play as well you know, just being able to deal with a loss. I didn't know what, I didn't know until that started happening, what that really felt like. And it was, it was painful, you know, that's part of the game. Um, so I went through a lot of process, how I really started in terms of the, the, the technical side of things, building a strategy. One of the traders on the, um, on the trade floor where I used to, obviously when I used to analyze a gentleman called Ray, he, uh, because I used to feed him certain bits of fundamental information, we used to get little little inside uh, insider tips, actually, whisper numbers uh, of data that's coming out beforehand. So then I would um, give him this stuff because he always, he used to always say to me, oh man, if you give me some of these data points early, I promise you, I'm going to make, I'm going to give you footballers money. He used to say, <laughs> I was like, no, that's fine. Don't, don't worry about that. I was just, I just wanted to build a relationship. And anyway, in exchange for, for me giving him certain sort of bits of insight that I had, he taught me um, the strategy that I still use today, which is supply and demand. So, yeah, in terms of your question, sort of the process of becoming a trader, I went through everything. Like I went through my four years of of trying to trying to trade uh, before I found any form of consistency. You know, my year one, as I say, was complete and utter failure. The year two was a little bit less failure, but I'm still failing. Year three, I'm, there's a balance there. And in year four, I started finding consistency. Um, I built you know, in terms of my transition away from the corporate world, I built a track record for 12 months. Mm -hmm. um, I built enough capital for myself, but then also I managed to find some private investment. Um, initially, it started with with family, but then um, some contacts within my network uh, were able to fund me. So I had a nice bit of cash to then take that leap of faith. Now, um, one thing I just want to, I know you probably want to jump in and ask me some questions, but in those- No, you're first, good. First off, yeah. you're good. Keep <laughs> <Yeah>. going. <laughs> When, when I was actually able to take that leap of faith, you know, it, it, you know, I was in, I was in my apartment, uh, the sun was shining. It's my first day just sitting there in my coffee and the screens. And I was like, Oh, this is game time, baby. I'm telling you from that day, it was all hell. The day from that day for three months solid, all hell, you know, I built this perfect track record with low drawdown of 10%. I was generating, you know, about between, uh, three and, and five percent, sometimes more per month. I had just it was stable. And then all shit uh, broke out. I just couldn't I combust. I just died inside. Um, so I had to I had to take a break a minute. And in, in, great. I had enough sort of savings and capital there still. 
but I just had to reevaluate things, see where I was going wrong. Um, and, um, yeah, I just had to make some adjustments. I found that with the strategy that I learned, I was trying to trade, you know, um, day trade essentially. And it just wasn't working for the strategy that I learned. So I adjusted, I started trading on a higher time frame rather than looking at the 15 minute, the 30 minute chart. I adjusted and started trading on, uh, looking from the daily and then looking for entries on the four hour. Um, so yeah, at, after that, after sort of, after those three months of failure, I picked up again and things started to become stable. Luckily I had patience with one of the key guys that was backing me. I had some patience there from him. So yeah, man, it's yeah. The, as Just going back to the, the track record that I built, then it was, it was just for me, it was just about just trying to generate something that was very stable. You know, I just wanted little, little bits like 5% for me was solid. You know, 5% yeah. was me solid, a low drawdown was good. Um, and, and that was, that was key. I, I, I was very, 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 very risk averse. You know, I got to make sure I come back to that question. Dude, you're, yeah. you're giving out so much sauce. I want to make sure that I don't miss any other questions that are mm -hmm. popping in my head in terms of, cause I also had a similar experience when I quit my job, I used to work as a wealth advisor for bank of America. And so when I, I had built up a pretty good track record working there and had invested enough money to be able to walk away. Now, yep. as soon as I quit my job, I had three months of losing and it was the yeah. most brutal three months because there was pressures that I had never really experienced before because people were counting on me. I didn't want to be a failure and have to go back to work, et cetera, et cetera. And at the end of the day, it was all in my head because nothing changed on the charts. Nothing changed about my strategy. So what did you, how were you able to get out of that rut first? And how did that pressure sort of impact your trading? How I was able to get out of that rut was um, I took, I did, I literally took two weeks um, off from, from trading. I was obviously trying to trade literally every single day. Um, I took two weeks off and just evaluated as i said um for me how i was approaching the market was or what the way in which i was taught i was marking up um you know supply and demand zones looking for those key you know the key areas of, of support and resistance but then i was trying to trade on 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 the lower time frame and it just wasn't working for me and i could see that i could see the mistakes uh, that was cropping up uh, with the strategy so it was just taking that time away and trying to approach rationally uh, in terms of the, 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 the optimization of my strategy. Um, and then I was able to, as I say, find what works and that was trading on the high time frames. you know, not, uh, stressing about these, these, these moves it, it, on, on a day trading front. And, and to this day, my strategy change again, and we will, we'll get into that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. do you have any specific reasons for why the smaller time frame was giving you trouble? Is it because you're getting early signals and entering early? Is it because you're getting like out of your trades prematurely because the smaller time frame patterns, or what do you feel like the issue is? No, to be fair, it was just getting in too early. You know, I, at the end of the day, like I'm, I'm a fundamentalist. So I had a view on where my baby was GU. So I had a view exactly on where GU was going, but I just couldn't get that entry right. You know, on mm -hmm. those lower time frames, I was just entering too early every time getting taken out. And then obviously, you know, what's going to happen. It's going in my direction, you know, in the second half of the day. So, um, yeah, man, it was just entering way too early, being too eager, um, and, and not being, not being patient enough, trying to write, find out, right, get the right time. So yeah, exactly. Too early is the issue. I mean, that's an issue that a lot of uh, fundamental traders have. You either get too married to your bias because you're like, I know that UJ is bullish because, uh, the, the central bank divergence, but the smaller time frame continues to push against you. Do you feel like fundamentals was a hindrance for you at the beginning? And uh, has that changed at all? Was it a hindrance? Yeah, it was. Because when, the thing is, when you have a, a, a fundamental view, you, <laughs> the ego takes over as well. It's like, as you just said there, say, for example, there is a monetary policy divergence. You're like, man, it's there in black and white. That's the facts. It should be going that way. But no, you got to always remember the, on a technical front, the market will do what the market will do. You know, sometimes shit doesn't make sense at all. It can not make sense fundamentally at all when you're looking at those lo lower time frames. I'm telling you, it doesn't. Uh, but it's it's a lot of noise and it's it's realizing that there is a lot of noise on, on the lower time frames. When you do go on the higher time frames and you analyze things fundamentally, it makes sense. But you can get over consumed uh, in those 15 minute, 30 minute candlesticks, even hourly at times. <laughs> but it's, it's trying to, you know, take a rational, um, you know, approach, sit back, look at those higher time frames. And then things will make sense, but it's getting overconsumed. I think in a noise. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I mean, those are some of, some of the issues that even I faced. Which is, I would be I would be re-entering a trade 
so many times that by the time the trade finally hit, the risk and reward would put me at break even. And so that's the sort of uh, zooming out, I think, is one of the biggest takeaways I've gotten so far. Definitely. So do you, do you look at fundamentals in a macro perspective or do you tend to be very sector focused or like a uh, specific country focused? No, bro, I'm looking like on a macro level. I'm looking across the board, you know, because everything has, a, you know, a, a, an impact right um, across the board. Like, sorry, throw me off here. <laughs> It, everything everything coincides with each other right I'm, I'm not just looking at a specific sector i'm looking across the board you know when for example just you know asset across asset classes right i've come from 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 that knowledge in terms of as an analyst and i've seen how you know certain ac asset classes have an impact on others how one asset class may move and then ha it has a domino effect to, uh, across the rest of them like just just one of the most recent example just for some of the listeners as i'm sure they'll know there's a massive rally um in bitcoin right uh recently why do we see that rally in Bitcoin? Because there was a failure in the banking sector. So we had a massive sale. And this is where people need to perhaps use their heads as a potential analyst and see, okay, there's been a failure here in the banking, in the traditional banking system. What potentially could benefit from that? What's the next thing? Crypto, you know, the untraditional. So we had that rally in Bitcoin. So I'm always thinking on, on a bigger uh, on a bigger level. I'm thinking what could, if this happens here, what could happen with this asset class? If you look in the uh, pandemic, right, back in March 2020, one of the first things actually to get hit, if you look uh, on the chart, was oil. Oil got hit hard. Why? Because the pandemic started in China, because China is the biggest importer of oil, or one of the biggest, I think, they're, they're, yeah, they are the biggest importer of oil. So what's going to get hit hard? You know, oil. So oil moved first. Then we started seeing equities come down. Um, you know, we just had that knock-on effect. Uh, so it's just using your head and seeing a bigger picture of things you know for sure i think what you're what you're referring to is really like being able to find correlations in the market and i think that that's where most of the money is being made today it's like uh, on the us side for example if you can understand the correlation of the fed's balance sheet to equities it's a it's a over 90% correlation so those are some of the higher probability trades so from your macro correlations, perspective exactly like from your macro perspective, what are you seeing across the board? Like what are, because you mentioned the word themes earlier, and I want to kind of touch on that. What are some of the themes that you're seeing on the macro scape? <clears throat> the, uh, the themes, well, the themes right now, um, a lot of people may be aware is we, we've, one of the biggest ones that we've had is, is the, the central banks, right? We're, we're trying to figure out who, who, well, now initially it was, we were on a, who's raising faster, right? So that's why the dollar was, was, was winning the race. We had the, the theme of, uh, Interest rates rises, okay? So just to put in perspective for everyone who doesn't get it, right? When we're raising interest rates, the value typically of a currency is going up. So essentially, we've just got this central bank race and the FOMC were winning that race. That was one theme, okay? Then we also had the theme of inflation, right? So inflation was rising drastically globally. Um, how are we tackling rising inflation? We're, we're raising interest rates, try and cool down spending, try and cool down prices, cool down the economy. So that was one theme as well. In terms of the themes right now, it's for me, it's that the divergence not being a divergence anymore. So how we had FMC winning the race, that gap is now narrowing, 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 and the dollar is losing its edge and we're having this more equilibrium. So the fact that there's going to be a more equal playing field now with these central banks and the rates, the FMC and the others, um, the dollar loses that edge. So this is a new theme right now that I'm seeing, dollar losing edge at, at present. But one thing that I'm keeping an eye on um, is still, uh, which isn't a talking theme yet, but it will crop up again, is recession. OK, and why I say that is because, look, we had this massive pandemic. After the pandemic, everyone, particularly in the States, you guys were blessed with these stimulus checks. You know, you guys were blessed with this very, very cheap money. And a lot of this money went into stocks, people pumping up stocks, people pumping the fuck out of crypto. And and now people don't have any mo accessible money. You know, they have it in these investments. Um, and, and at some point, shit's going to crumble uh, for, for the consumer. And, and the economy is going to is going to falter. That cash that all everyone had so accessible to is, is dried up and there's going to be some problems, um, you know, probably in Q2. Just on that theme of the FOMC was sort of winning that race. Do you feel like that's a that's what's leading to this theme of de-dollarization? Everyone's trying to get away from the dollar because one, we overprinted. So we kind of forced the rest of the world into that hellhole. And then we started getting more aggressive than the rest of the world. And so that kind of put a strain on their economies. Is, is that why you think the Fed hasn't started raising more aggressively? Not to piss off the rest of the world? Or why do you think that that's... <laughs> 
Well, I, I, I genuinely think, right, in, in, in my opinion, obviously we've had this banking crisis. I just generally think that the FMC does not want to spook the markets, uh, to be honest. Just as, this was my opinion. I think that the FMC is seeing a recession potentially coming. This is why these guys are really taking their foot off the gas now. Obviously, the last rate session was just 25. Markets wanted 50. I think these guys see something that not everyone sees um, and uh, they they did really overstep the mark. I know they're trying to bring down inflation, but they raised very aggressively when the consumer is so, so delicate, as I explained there with the overexpending and not having much cash now available. Mm. So I think that they're, they, they see something basically, and that's why they're really taking their foot off the gas, in my opinion. So they're just going to start to tiptoe closer as opposed to making any uh, fast movements in either direction, you think? Yeah, they're going to tiptoe for now. I know, I guarantee they would want to cut rates. But if they do that, all hell will break loose and the markets will panic. So I think, yeah, tiptoe for now and sidestepping, pausing for now. Yeah. When I look at the bull and the bear case for the dollar, it's typically all around central bank policy. And so do you have any sort of catalysts that you look at that would sort of drive the bull or the bear case for the dollar right now? For the dollar outside of monetary policy? Uh, well, maybe including monetary policy or outside, whether it's a banking crisis, whether it's geopolitical or whether it's central bank policy related. Look, at the end of the day, as a um, outside of monetary policy. So for me, obviously, I'm seeing the dollar coming down now, just as I said, as we get to a more equal playing field. The, the next thing would be to drive the, the flows back into the greenback. I think uh, once the Dixie drop, I'm, I'm seeing the Dixie dropping below 100. Flows are going to come back into play when when the recession fears start to be when we start hearing those chatter because obviously as you know at the end of the day the dollar is a safe haven it's the safest currency on the world in, in this world it's one the U.S. economy is the largest economy in the world and 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 will be for the foreseeable and two we have to remember the dollar is the reserve currency of the world every single business does business in dollars right everything mm -hmm. M and A you know mergers acquisitions everything. Is, is in in dollars so it's a safe haven so um that will be the next thing to really ramp up some flows back into the greenback when those safe haven uh flows pick pick up so we're basically like one small slip away geopolitically from all the money rushing back into the safest uh economy yeah yeah exactly i'm on this all the chart addicts members who are listening to this you guys know i'm happy because he's basically just <laughs> saying the stuff that we've been saying for a little bit so i like when people <laughs> agree with me typically awesome. makes me feel good. <laughs> now nice. um uh, okay, so I actually had a conversation with Bob Elliott, who used to manage Ray Dalio's investments at Bridgewater Associates. So he was the head nice. of FX trading for a while, and then he ended up sort of becoming the head of Ray Dalio's personal investment team. And a big theme of that conversation was the difference between a dynamic, which is like a real theme in the markets, and a narrative, which is sort of what you were explaining earlier, which is like Deutsche Bank says something. Mm -hmm. So how do you look at the difference between like a genuine theme and a dynamic, or sorry, and a narrative? Sorry, can yeah, elaborate on that again. Yeah, so basically like a narrative is just a story that's going around like, oh, the dollar is no longer going to be the world's reserve currency. That's a narrative that's going around, but not necessarily backed by truth because over 60% of global reserves are still in dollars, 75% of global trade, et cetera. But then dynamics are like observable patterns. So like a theme. So how do you differentiate like the noise from the actual theme? Uh, and how do you think about those two things? <laughs> that's a good question, right? <laughs> My bad. A, re a really good question. Um, to to be honest with you, bro, I, 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 look, I, yes, I'm a fundament, I'm a fundamentalist when I approach the markets, but I, I am also like to keep things basic, right? I, I think at the end of the day, we're, I'm a trader as well, and as a trader, my my role is to see what is being spoken about, what is every major news wire talking about, what are, are, are institutions talking about, what are the, the main the main themes, and the themes right now, and is what's driving the markets. That's I trade in what I'm seeing. Right. I can have my own view, uh, you know, as, as as you say, but I'm I'm digesting what everybody's saying, what's being talked about and then how that relates on a chart, because that, that's what's going to move the markets. It doesn't matter how I, I think think things from different from different, uh, you know, dynamics. It's what's being sp spoken about and what is moving the markets. You know, sometimes there's, there's times when, for example, you know, an, uh, the FOMC decision comes out and someone is interpreting it completely different to how, how I am. And I feel I'm, I'm, I'm correct because of X, Y, and Z, but they think that it's like, like this, then the market thinks it should be like this. So it's going to, the market will move how it moves. So it, it doesn't matter, you know, it's, but, yeah. it's basically just trade what you see and not what you think. 
That's that's it. That's it. There we go. So if I was, so I, I actually like the realness of that conversation right there, which is hey, don't overcomplicate it. Keep things simple. So if I was a trader that came up to you and I was like your protege, and I was like, what are some of the <laughs> what are some of the personality traits or characteristics that I would need to develop over X amount of years that will help me become a successful trader? What do you think those qualities are? The first thing I'd say is look, fully educate yourself. Um, fundamentally, I know, obviously, I'm going to say that because I'm fundamentalist, but I'm serious. You you need to know what you're trading, you're, you know, what you're putting your money into every day. You need to understand it in and out the mechanics of it. Right. And what's influencing that asset class or that, uh, you know, that pair that you're trading. So that's the first thing I say. Educate yourself fundamentally, uh, you know, on a macro level about the asset class that you're trading. On, on next step is try and work on yourself. Now, this is easy said than done. Um, is try and work on yourself, uh, you know, em emotionally. How are you able to contain your emotions? The only way I was able to learn that was through what I always say, exposure therapy, um, where I, for example, I, you know, I got greedy too many times and it, and it burnt me seriously. You know, I got um, egotistical too many times and it, and it burnt me. So I, I went through, I had to go through that several times, expose myself to that the shit that I don't, I, I didn't want to occur. Um, I had to expose myself to that. So try and if you can just quickly establish what are the negative traits of trading and avoid, you know, that, that greed being too greedy, that fear, uh, be, de being too fearful to execute, um, your, your, uh, to, to execute for your position and just keep it simple, right? Things <laughs> are so overcomplicated for me today in terms of my, my, my trading strategy, I, I, you know, it's supply and demand. I'm marking up those big zones. Then I'm looking at very basic chart patterns. I'm looking for consolidation patterns, like when we form ranges in pennants or flags. Uh, and then I'm looking at candlestick behavior as well, like certain candlesticks that we're forming, like morning stars, you know, to signal trend reversals. I'm keeping it simple. You know, I just have very simple rules. So yeah, those are the three main things for me. Understand your, your instrument on, on, on fundamentally inside and out, the workings of it. Two, try and get that psychology, your emotion in check and have that detachment. So when you're at your trading terminal, all those emotions are at the door. Mm. And then num number three, as I said, just try and keep it very simple. So on the theme of, and that was excellent, by the way, that, those are some incredible tips. If you guys need to go back and review that last 30 seconds, I, I would highly recommend taking some notes on that. Now, in terms of keeping it simple, um, simple doesn't always mean easy. And the thing that a lot of supply and demand traders find is that because I have a supply and demand trading strategy as well is that they tend to not have a clear enough execution strategy when it gets to the zones. And so there's premature entries, liquidity grabs and things that end up uh, happening. What are some things that you found that gave you trouble in supply and demand trading? And how have you been able to sort of remedy those? Yeah, well, to be fair, a lot, a lot of fake outs, right? Um, it still happens to this day, but I'm able to just sit on my hands a little bit more. I think I think it comes down to when so when the price enters those zones, I know you can be very, you know, eager. Look, actually, scrap that a minute. Every single bit of analysis, Roy, is subjective. So you may draw a zone completely different uh, to how I would. You know, you may put you may wait for the uh the whole candlestick, the body of the candlestick to enter the zone, or you may register uh, leave a zone with the, the wick above you know, of the zone, it's all subjective. It's finding what works for you. Now, for me, like in terms of how I tr tried to perfect that was uh, patience, first of all, um, you know, I, I, I'm not just going to, as soon as the price enters that zone, I'm going to hit sell or I've got orders there already waiting to sell because no, you get a lot of fake outs. It happens, you know, it's institutional manipulation, all of that shit. So it's just having a little bit more, bit more patience. So when that price enters that zone for me, you know, I just want to see a few more things, as I say, how the candlesticks are responding. Um, maybe see uh, you know, a nice bearish engulfing uh, rejection there, a bit of consolidation of a flag before we fall, um, a range before we're getting that breakout. So just have a little bit more patience, I think, without getting too excited of the price entering that zone. My point. Incredible. Patience pays, you know. Patience really does pay. Uh, this is a segment that we typically do on the show, which is kind of like a rapid fire round, which are things yeah. that everyone has some different different opinions on like stop losses and prop firms and things. So I'm just going to list off some of these things if you can just give me your opinion on them. Okay. Cool. So we'll start off with a very simple one, which is using a stop loss. Well, my opinion? Yeah. A must. <laughs> okay. A must. <laughs> well, some folks say that they use a uh, stop loss for capital preservation. Some of them use it for risk management. I only want to risk 1% per trade. Do you have a specific way of looking at how to use a stop loss? For me, uh, I... 
only risking one to two percent. Now, um, when I'm risking more two percent, I have more reasons, more gagging reasons to take this trade. I am look, everyone's different, but I am very risk averse because I tell you why is because I came from experience a lot of shit. As I said, I went through that exposure therapy and um, I just don't want to go back there again. That feeling of that I've risked 5%, 10% on a trade. I don't like that. I don't feel comfortable. I want to be totally at ease. So my stop loss there, my one or 2% stop loss, uh, I feel comfortable coming away from my terminal, not having to look at my phone and almost forgetting. I know it's cliche, but it's true. I generally leave my trade to it. And 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 there's no surprise when I open, because before, you know, the, the years when I was risking more than one to 2%, and then I'd enter a, a you know, a, a losing streak, man, it was damaging. It was yeah, damaging, yeah, yeah. not only for my account, but for my mental health. For sure. I hated it. And I, I just don't want to go back there again. <laughs> for sure. I think all success in trading happens when, like that sickening feeling of not wanting to blow the account outweighs the greed of wanting to be in that trade. It's like if, when you're first starting out, that greed is so strong. You just want to keep, you want to be in the trade. Eventually that sickening feeling, that PTSD from all the times that you've fucked up the account, that tends to be a little bit stronger than the the urge to want to get in. Exactly. Totally agreed. Agreed there. So let's, let's go through, uh, what about prop firms? What do you think about trading your own capital versus trading prop firms? Um, look, trading your own capital is great. I know... I know people want to get to a stage where they're actually making a chunky income from, from trading with their own capital. And that, that for most people, that's going to take quite some time. I'd say, look, that quite some time to build up that capital is great time for you to, to develop and for you to gradually build. So what I did, just, just so you know, in terms of um, to quickly build up my own capital, I, I'll, I'm going to talk about prop farms in a moment. Mm -hmm. What I did was once I'd obviously, uh, I was confident in myself and I had that track record there, I was confident in myself of being able to extract money from the markets. Uh, from my wage, um, every week, I would just put in deposit, deposit, deposit into my trading account, just keep building, building, building organically, right? And obviously I was, I was generating income uh, as well. As, uh, from, I was compounding my gains that I was making from my account. So if you can, once you've proven, just keep topping up your account and you, your account eventually get to a good, to a good stage where, where you're a, uh, decent, <laughs> earning a decent enough income. In terms of prop firms, I think they're a great idea. Okay. I think they're a great idea in the sense of it does remove a, a lot of strain that it has when you're trading your own capital a lot. Um, and then it also, I feel like they ups your game in a sense. It's like, okay. So I've removed a little bit of, of, of emotion, emotional attachment to, to money, but then I've, I've got, I want to prove to this, to this prop company. I want to prove to, to my peers that I can progress and get funded. I can yeah. progress through the ranks and get, and get greater capital. So I, I think they're a great idea. Uh, I'm not going to be one to throw slander on them um, because people, they're seemingly working for a lot of people. Um, mm -hmm. I can see from, from what I've seen on social media and, and stuff, they're doing great. So hats off to them. So if you're already a successful, like if you have a proven sh a system and you're seeing success, that's probably when it makes sense to go out there and try one of these things. If you, yeah, if you're, if you're proven already, yes. If you're not, I think don't, don't waste your money because that, you know, that, and that's where the other, the other side of it comes in. You got to remember the prop traders, the prop firms will make money every time that you fail. Cause you're going to keep going and keep going to try the challenge in. So get your shit right first and then go to the prop firm. I know you, you're Beautiful. eager and you want to try, but get your shit right first. And I think the operative thing that you said there was uh, once you're proven, you said add more from your income once you're proven. So it's mm -hmm. not just add more to your income once you see one week of success or once you have a little bit of success. It's like once you have a proven system and you're seeing consistency, that's when it makes sense to pile in, right? Exactly. And I think what people got, is, is this a good point that you said there, right? What people got to remember is trading is not um, you know, we're not just looking at your gains for the day because anyone can do that. Anyone can make some gains on a day. Anyone can make some gains on a week. Anyone can make some gains on a month. I want to see you doing it month after month after month and then year as well, year after year. It's not just what you made in a day. I know people are quick to get excited. Man, yeah, I made my first K in a day. But are you going to sustain that? Yep. I get excited when I talk to folks that talk in quarterly and annual terms. That's mm. when I start to know okay, I'm talking to somebody that, that kind of has their shit together. Mm. Um, let's go through these fire rounds real quick. Taking okay. partials and then break even. You can either answer those together or you can answer them separately. I'm all down for taking partials. The reason being, 
just because I see how quickly things can change. Um, so you always got to pay yourself psychologically because the, the, the numbers on the chart, the, what you're seeing on, on your terminal and your MT4, your MT5, whatever you're trading is not yours until you've taken some of that money um, off the table and actually locked it in. So I'm all down for, for, um, for taking partials. In terms of breaking even, yes, move those stops to, to, to break even where you can um, if it makes sense to do so. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I mean, clearly you have to have a strategy for these things, but um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's exactly. good to hear that you're, that you're on that side. Yeah. Now, a lot of people say that this one is discretionary. It's like, it's just all about personality, which is risk and reward versus win rate. Now, obviously you need a good balance of both, but some people are like, well, you didn't need a high win rate because you have a big risk and reward. Some people are like, well, you should get a high win rate strategy. So you don't need as big of a risk and reward. Do you have an opinion on that? Uh, to be honest, I just think what whatever works for you, you know, whatever works for you, it, you got to come down to looking at your win you got to understand what your, your your win rate is, right? Your percentage of wins. How how likely are you to, to win this trade? And then base your risk to reward off that. You know, is, that's it, really. You know, right, you so can't be, if you've got a, 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 yeah, that's it. No, I mean, I just love what you're saying. It's just keep it simple. And if it works for you, it works. There's really no rules to trading as long as it's it's working for you. That's it. Exactly. Love to hear it. Now, is there anything that you'd like to leave folks with? There's a trader right now. He's doing his laundry. He's at the gym. He's doing something listening to this podcast. Is there anything that you would uh, urge folks to do after this or to focus on? Yeah. Okay. If First things first, if I just, just quickly say before, what, before I, what I want them to focus on is, firstly, guys, can you just please, please, please not rush this process of, of being a trader? There's it, you know, if you want longevity, uh, I know it's cliche to say, but please do not bypass the process. Cherish everything. Um, you know, your learning curve, I, I, as I say, I think it's a good four years for you to become a profitable trader. If you get past those four years, you make it, man, the world is your oyster. Um, and in terms of if, if what you want, what, what I want you to focus on, if you are just a technical trader, or even if you're a fundamentalist, um, you know, never stop learning. Uh, as a if you're not a fundamental trader and you, you purely focus on technicals, please just start reading. Look, there's little bits on CNBC. There's little bits on Bloomberg, on Reuters. All these guys are writing little summary pieces on on what's happening in the market today. They're very uh, today, they're very easily digestible. Before they weren't. They used to piss me off, but now they're they're more digestible for everybody. So so start reading on those and building your knowledge. Anything you don't understand, type it into Investopedia, um, and it'll give you the answer or YouTube. Absolutely incredible. Um, real quick, Gold Hedge Solution. What is that? I'm curious. Gold Hedge Solution. So essentially, this is uh, my new project. It's why I've been quite quiet on the social media front. Um, basically, uh, I'm not a tech guy by any means, but I had this concept and I had these uh, guys that I work with in, in Asia um, build this technology. So essentially, uh, obviously, trading's a, a, a massive part of it is psychology and, and this ultimately removes that so what we're doing is is uh, i'm sure you've heard of the term uh the term arbitrage mm -hmm. so um you know buying and selling of, of this in this case gold um simultaneously and you know we're trying to profit on the small difference in price um so this essentially has been running since the commence of 2022 in terms of on a live account it's been tested for three years but actually on a live account since 2022 on live accounts um excuse me and believe it or not, we've been doing between sort of 15, 20% per month. Um, it's semi-automated. So in, in, in the sense that all a trader would have to do on one of their accounts, they're pressing buy and the other, they're pressing sell on one of the accounts, it generates levels, a TP and stop loss. You just need to put that input, those levels that you get the TP and the stop loss on one account into the other, obviously on the flip, on the, on the reverse, um, and let the trade do its thing. Um, it spitting out, we get opportunity, depending on how volatile it is. Uh, gold is in the days it's given around sort of three to five opportunities per day the only risk is it comes down to human error um human error and there's specific rules with the, the the product so for example trades need to be booked literally simultaneously you know we can't have dollar difference in the the buy and the sell price we um trades have to be done within two minutes time uh, there's a few rules some risk management to, stuff like you see yeah. people like over risking on the on the the system well, no, there's actually set. So for it, for the account size, there's actually set lot sizes that can't be changed um, wow. until it hits a certain, until you get your account to a certain level. Yeah, so, it's, it's it's very stable right now. And, you know, pray <laughs> to the universe that it remains that way um, because I'm going to be rolling it out and, and put really putting my neck on a line here by rolling it out to, to, to everybody. 
<laughs> for sure. More power to you and best of luck with that project. We yeah. still have VIP tickets for you to the FX Summit 2023 conference if you're willing to show up. And if you guys want to come yes. meet us and potentially Ken, if he decides to show up, you guys can meet us there. Ken, where can folks find you online? Uh, just Instagram. That's where I'm most active. So real Ken Chigbo is my uh, Instagram. <laughs> All right. And we'll leave that in the comments below. Ken, thank you for stopping by the Expert Trader Podcast, dropping so many gems. We appreciate you. Thank you, Roy. I appreciate that, buddy. All right, everybody, we just saw some incredible traders here at the FIP compound. Make sure that you guys grab your tickets to the FX Summit 2023 conference. If you want to meet all these incredible traders, if you want to meet myself and learn from the best. So we'll see you guys, fxsummit2023.com.